is it could be considered part of the uh, Hohokam prehistoric cultural tradition. Uh, but I've uh, been involved in quite a few other uh, time periods and cultural traditions as well. I work for the Gila River Indian community and uh, the cultural resource management program. So I'm a, uh, so we're located just south of Phoenix. I'm sure most or all of you have probably driven through here. If you've driven on Interstate 10 from Phoenix to Tucson, then you drive right down the middle of Gila River Indian community. And you probably have heard of Wild Horse Pass Casino and Resort and those places. And they're obviously affiliated with the community, but uh, not part of what I do. Uh, but at any rate, um, through uh, most of my career here in Southern Arizona, I've been lucky to be involved with quite a few projects that have uh, been looking at ancient canal systems, canal features, and related features such as uh, actual irrigated fields, uh, reservoirs, other water management features that are ubiquitous here in the what we call the Phoenix Basin. So for the Gila River and the Lower Salt River in the Phoenix area. Um, I think most of you as uh, archaeologists or avocationalists uh, probably know a little bit about the vast irrigation networks that once existed here, both not only prehistorically, but of course today, but in prehistoric times is what I'm going to be talking mostly about today. Um, so without further ado, I'll just go ahead and do this. And I, I actually uh, have given this talk several times, but I was originally uh, gave this as part of a uh, uh, seminar at the Oriental Institute in the University of Chicago about five years ago now. Um, and it was a, a, a seminar on irrigation in early state societies. And most of the people involved were from uh, working in Mesopotamia, the Near East, such as parts of uh, Jordan um, uh, and other areas that have more evidence as well as uh, uh, China, uh, Southeastern Asia. So it was really quite a uh, unique experience. And they asked uh, me to come uh, along, even though the Holcom are not exactly considered to be a state society and nor I don't think that anybody argues that at this point. Uh, but we have done so much work with irrigation systems here that they wanted a little bit of perspective from someone uh, like myself who's worked a lot with these features. So that's what I originally wrote this paper for. And so, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this uh, presentation screen. And when this pops up on your screen here, um, if everybody would just go ahead and mute themselves. Um, actually, I'm just going to mute everybody uh, right now, and you can unmute yourself later when you want to ask questions and those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, anyway, let me pop up the uh, presentation here. <clears throat> So uh, at this point, most of you should be able to see, I've got a slide up, it's just a title slide. It's got the title of the, uh, the talk. However, a lot of you may be seeing a little frame view with some of the people that you can see still. So uh, this is just one of the quirks of Zoom. If you do not want to have that in your view frame, you can minimize those windows uh, and, uh, and that way you don't have to be seeing everybody on the screen at the same time. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of like uh, uh, hiding these thumbnails now. So I'm not sure exactly what you can see. So I just want to make sure that you uh, know that you can move those things around on your own. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to talk about today is to talk about the methodological and the theoretical approaches that might lead to a better understanding of the function of irrigation in early states. And to do that, we have to bring to bear a range of techniques from varied disciplines. Because the generation of more primary data on irrigation in early state societies will largely be provided by archeological investigation, it is critical for us to take advantage of new developments in archeological methods. Here, I will present archeological examples from the Sonoran Desert in Southern Arizona that can offer a robust methodological approach to the excavation and explanation of irrigation. 
advancements in archaeological survey, excavation, and analysis methods over the last 50 years have produced a surge of new information on ancient canal systems in Arizona. These discoveries occurred largely during projects conducted in compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act enacted in 1966 and now in its 54th year of operation. So what I will be talking about tonight are techniques used to detect and document the archaeological signatures of irrigation features, including canals, reservoirs, and fields. Studies have given us better data not only on the size, structure, and chronology of canal systems, but also on higher level questions concerning demography and socio-political organization. This information can be used with hydraulic modeling to enhance our understanding of irrigation management. These examples from Arizona do not derive from early state societies and no written records exist for these Neolithic cultures. Nevertheless, the investigative techniques can be used anywhere that relict canal systems are available for archaeological study. And uh, just uh, real briefly, some of these are just photos uh, that I've cobbled together from some projects around southern Arizona. Um, the one on the upper left there is from Sky Harbor Project, and that's Kathy Henderson standing in a trench there next to one of the larger main canals in Canal System 2. Um, on the right is actually a canal in the Scottsdale area uh, where you can still see the gravel embankments and looks like a, someone had driven their car right down the middle of it. And then the two photos on the bottom are actually from a project we did out here where there were some canals that had actually been buried by dunes sand dunes that had actually formed over the last 1,000 years. So that was actually kind of one of the more interesting uh, project discoveries out here on Gila River. Uh, map of the Sonoran Desert here for you. Uh, human occupation in the Sonoran Desert spans 12,000 years, but agricultural products didn't appear until about 4,000 years ago. Archaeologists now know that the earliest canals in Arizona are over 3,000 years old and were developed independently of the earliest canal construction in Mesoamerica and Mexico. These early agricultural period canals are known primarily in the Tucson area. And uh, here's a couple of photos from one of the better known sites there, Las Capas. Um, these canals in the Tucson area during that period were rel relatively short and fed small-scale field systems. However, the excellent preservation of these systems revealed details such as individual fields, planting holes, and most recently, a set of footprints left by ancient farmers. And on your screen, the lower left slide there is a photograph of a uh, an agricultural field, uh, sort of a square outline there where you can see the folks walking around and those little holes out there are planting holes, uh, but there also were some preserved uh, footprints that were left in the, uh, the muddy uh, sort of surface of the field probably 2,500 years ago. Now the discovery of these irrigation canals that date as early as 1500 BC and maize at around 2100 BC has really revolutionized our understanding of cultural and agricultural development in the U.S. Southwest. Uh, most of the investigated canals in the Sonoran Desert are related to the Hohokam, a culture of sedentary agriculturalists that flourished for a millennium between AD 450 and 1450. The core of the Hohokam culture was the Phoenix Basin, which includes the Lower Salt and the Middle Gila Rivers, uh, which are indicated on the map on the left there. The Hohokam are renowned for their earthen public monuments, such as ball courts and platform mounds, and craft items such as red on buff pottery and machine marine shell jewelry. The Hohokam sphere of influence included almost all of Southern Arizona, as you can see in the light uh, shaded, uh, lightly gray shaded outline on that map on the left, and almost all of southern Arizona in a regional system that was linked through a network of ball court villages. <clears throat> the Hohokam are noted especially for the construction of hundreds of miles of canals that irrigated thousands of acres. 
The Holocom built the most extensive canal systems in the pre-Hispanic Americas north of Peru, and it is thought that they could irrigate up to 70,000 acres of land or more. This map shown here was compiled by Jerry Howard and depicts the totality of known canals and canal systems in the lower Salt River Valley within the Phoenix metropolitan area. The most notable locales are Canal System 1 on the south side of the river and at the bottom of your map, and Canal System 2 on the north side of the river, uh, both of which integrated multiple main canals taking water out of the Salt River. A tremendous amount of labor and management was needed to build and maintain these systems. Uh, now, just a brief uh, comment on this map, which I'm sure many of you have seen or seen versions of this, and I've added some names of some of the uh, sub-canal systems that some people refer to here, but you can see that this is actually uh, the totality of all the canals that are known or documented within the Lower Salt River Valley. And um, it is uh, quite certain that not all of these canals were being used and operated at the same time. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of the uh, development of these systems over time, but there's some other really uh, interesting and quite fascinating uh, uh, um, studies that you can look into, including those by Jerry Howard that have talked about this. And um, also most recently, uh, Chris Castledine, who got his PhD last year at Arizona State University, uh, actually added some really interesting new information about Canal System 1. Uh, based on a number of studies that he has done over the last many years, uh, some of which with Jerry Howard. <clears throat> uh, a consensus exists that the Hohokam did not achieve a state level of socio-political development. However, researchers agree that the Hohokam conformed poorly with neo-evolutionary models of social complexity. Theorists now uh, posit that the Holocom maintained a corporate or egalitarian ideology, but by the late classic period, they had developed complex internal ranking and institutionalized leadership positions. This indicates a more complex socio-political structure than has been uh, uh, assumed through the neo-evolutionary perspective. That the Holocom are not considered a state, quote unquote, also masks the complexity of their canal systems as well as irrigation management. All right, now a brief history of irrigation research in Arizona. <clears throat> the extensive Holcomb canal systems have drawn the attention of researchers for over a century. Early archaeological studies were privately funded investigations in the late 1800s and early 1900s, which were focused on mapping the location of prehistoric canals. Pioneering efforts by investigators like Adolf Bandelier in the late 1890s and Jesse Fuchs in the early 1900s culminated in the excellent work of Omar Turney and Frank Midvale. Frank Midvale made significant contributions to the mapping of canals and settlements during his survey efforts between about 1918 and 1971. This map on the screen represents decades of survey in the Coolidge area along the Gila River Valley, uh, which shows uh, some of these dashed lines indicate the, the locations of canals, which are actually fairly accurately mapped in a lot of cases and have uh, provided a great deal of uh, information for researchers such as myself and others who've come a lot later. So the work that Midvale did, as well as Omar Turney in those early years, provided a context for studying Holcomb archaeology in the Salt River and Gila River Valleys. In academia, research on irrigation moved at a slow pace. Harold Gladwin and Emil Howery with Gila Pueblo uh, in the 1930s conducted pioneering work at Snaketown in their first set of excavations, which provided the first well-documented excavation of a Hohokam Canal. Howery, who's shown here standing in an excavated canal segment, returned for a second round of work on the Snaketown Canal System in 1964, which expanded our knowledge of Hohokam irrigation even further. Richard Woodbury, also with the University of Arizona, conducted important excavations at canals in Phoenix at the Park of the Four Waters by Pueblo Grande, as well as at Snaketown, and he established some of the first scientific archeological approaches to canal studies. 
Archaeological research changed with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. By requiring archaeological studies in conjunction with federal undertakings, especially through Section 106 compliance of the National Historic Preservation Act, this law provided a new source of funding for research and jobs, which led to the advent of cultural resource management and vastly accelerated Hohokam archaeology. Canal studies were few at first, with a notable early CRM effort by Arizona State Museum, led by Bruce Massey at the Park of the Four Waters adjacent to Pueblo Grande. And that's what this photo is, is a photo of Bruce standing in a large trench next to one of the larger canals that they found during the uh, original Hohokam Expressway project. Full recognition of the importance of irrigation research occurred in the 1980s with the initiation of the Las Colinas project and the La Ciudad project, which were conducted in advance of new freeway construction in Phoenix. The Las Colinas project integrated an advanced research design for studying irrigation features and their environmental context. The project identified large canals and settling basins within Canal System 2. Uh, and just as a, a, a comment here, the map on your right is sort of a project area map, uh, which was portions of Interstate 10 near its uh, now interchange with Interstate 17 um, which is where a lot of their work was focused on the uh, freeway clearance project within the site of Las Colinas. So their study addressed issues such as irrigation technology, labor requirements for canal construction, as well as the use of geomorphology in canal studies. The project also included the pioneering reconstruction of past stream flow of the Salt River using tree ring data. Likewise, the La Ciudad project likewise pushed the boundaries of irrigation research through the discovery and documentation of large canals, reservoirs, and a diversion structure. The legacy of these projects was a solid approach for canal research, which is still followed today. One legacy of the La Ciudad project, which Jerry Howard was involved with, uh, was the development of a long-term research project in Canal System 2 that Jerry continued to lead for about 20 years or longer. This resulted in several important outcomes, including a revised map of the prehistoric canals and villages in the Salt River Valley, uh, which I showed you in the slide before, the continued use of a trained geomorphologist in canal studies, and this would include Gary Huckleberry and Fred Niles, as uh, which you can actually see a photo of uh, Fred Niles down there on the lower left uh, of this uh, slide. Also the usage of open channel equations to calculate channel velocity and the discharge of individual canal fe features, as well as progress on dating canals using ceramics, radiocarbon dating, as well as archaeomagnetic dating of canal clays. Many other projects push the boundaries of irrigation research, and there are now thousands of excavated irrigation features in Arizona. Important milestones include the Price Road Freeway Project, or the Loop 101 in Tempe, which excavates one of the most complex areas of intersecting canals ever seen. The Scottsdale Canal System was also elucidated during a highway project along State Route 87. The Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport runway project, as well as the SkyTrain project, which a photograph is shown here that I mentioned. This is Kathy Henderson with uh, Desert Archaeology standing near one of these very large uh, canals in Canal System 2. These made great strides in understanding Canal System 2, including the use of optically stimulated luminescence dating, or OSL dating, to obtain absolute dates of canal sediments themselves, as well as the discovery of an unprecedented evidence of a field system near the airport. So these projects really helped to refine and advance canal excavation analysis and dating techniques. On the Gila River, <clears throat> uh, National Historic Preservation Act projects initially weren't as numerous as in Phoenix, but they did include some notable studies, such as for the Salt Gila Aqueduct project in the 1980s and at the GRU site outside of Coolidge. Irrigation research increased dramatically with the creation of the Gila River Indian Community's Cultural Resource Management Program in 1993, 
which investigated prehistoric irrigation across the vast res reservation landscape under funding from the Bureau of Reclamation in conjunction with the Pima Maricopa Irrigation Project. Two decades of research have provided a comprehensive map of canal systems on the Middle Gila River and detailed information on hundreds of excavated canals, dozens of reservoirs, and multiple locales with irrigated fields and field systems. And so this map that you're seeing now is a map that uh, we've worked at where I work on Gila River Indian Community to compile. And the uh, dashed uh, boundary that you see in there is the reservation boundary. The red lines are the prehistoric canals that are originating along the Gila River. So from right to left, you're looking at the Casa Grande Canal System at the very far right, which is above uh, Florence, Arizona and extends all the way down to the confluence of the salt with the Salt River at the very upper left of the map here. And uh, what we found is that there are between 13 and 15 separate canal systems that were built and operated during the Hohokam cultural tradition uh, or the Hohokam millennium between 450 and 1450. And for a perspective, you can see the canals that are extending from the Salt River at the upper point, uh, upper part of the map where they actually intersect the reservation in some places, as well as a few canals along Queen Creek uh, at the right-hand side of your map there uh, that are a little bit smaller, but they're still in there. You can see them on there as well. <clears throat> Section 106 compliance work also expanded our knowledge of irrigation outside the Phoenix Basin. Most of these canal systems were considerably smaller than those in the Phoenix Basin, and many were unknown prior to NHPA work. In the Tucson Basin, Jonathan Mabry and others like Jim Vent identified a long tradition of irrigation agriculture starting over 3,000 years ago prior to the advent of the Holocom, and they defined the early agricultural period. Uh, this work established the existence of canals of much greater antiquity than had been known and also resulted in one of the largest holes ever excavated in Arizona archaeology. And uh, that hole is pictured partly in this slide here, which is Las Capas, uh, the, uh, the later round of excavations that were led by Jim Vent and Desert Archaeology. Um, which was, if any of you all got an opportunity to see that work, it was, a, it was an immense uh, uh, area that they excavated. And uh, what you're seeing there are these white lines that have been painted onto the ground by the archeologists to denote the boundaries of uh, agricultural field cells, as well as small lateral canals that are emanating through this part of the Las Capas canal system. And so what we have learned by all of this is that indigenous people were farming with canals along many of the streams in the Sonoran Desert. So the investigation of relict irrigation features is a process of discovery, documentation, analysis, and interpretation. So here I'll review the techniques used in this process as they, as they are noted here in this slide. It's critical that archaeologists adopt a broad perspective and integrate a range of environmental and cultural contextual data. These run from the large to the small scale perspectives, <clears throat> from remote sensing imagery to ground survey and geophysical prospecting to testing and excavation. Using remote sensing technology is an advantage to many studies of irrigation. Remote sensing provides a regional or a bird's eye view and access to data contained in wavelengths beyond the range of the human eye. A variety of remote sensing sources are available, including standard aerial photography and satellite imagery such as Corona, LIDAR, as well as Google Earth. Multispectral imagery facilitates a more enhanced analysis of the landscape and allows detection of features that aren't visible on the ground. An example in this slide here is shown, which uses Google Earth Pro and QuickBird imagery, uh, which shows the, on the left, the satellite imagery views where you can see uh, linear earthen features that have been sort of highlighted in those lines and the red arrows. And then on the ground, what this looks like on the ground, and that's me standing along uh, that same canal alignment, which 
Uh, it doesn't look like much right now, but you can see it on the aerial photo and then on the ground, it's basically a linear uh, low-lying earthen mound, a linear earthen mound that is strewn with artifacts, which is one of the key elements of uh, signatures of canals in the uh, Hohokam area. Other useful resources are historic maps, geological maps, and soil survey maps. Geological maps help define areas of the landscape that were most suitable for ancient irrigation. Soil maps not only help to identify locales suitable for irrigation, but they can also reveal actual areas of ancient irrigation due to the significant impact of long-term irrigation. Because irrigation can have a long-term impact on soils, soil surveys can record pedological evidence of previously irrigated soils. This map shows how irrigated soils in the Snaketown Canal system along the Gila River are identified as a distinct soil on modern soil maps. And so uh, this is actually taken from a study uh, that was part of my dissertation field work many years ago. Uh, but what you're looking at are uh, the blue and sort of the light, uh, dark blue, light blue lines and the magenta lines are canals within the Snaketown Canal system. Uh, and the background uh, shaded areas are the soil phases that are on the modern soil map. And so what you can see, and I'm not sure if you can actually see my pointer on this, but uh, the sort of central area that's kind of a light, um, you know, light orange, light tan color in the middle of the canal field areas, those are actually recorded by soil scientists as a separate soil phase. But what we found in our research is that those are actual soils that were formed as a result of up to 700 to 1,000 years of irrigation in those areas. And uh, we have a, a, a paper in geoarchaeology that goes into this in detail, and I'm happy to share that with uh, anyone who's interested later. Um, <clears throat> Al Dart also, for example, found that in soil maps, there were low ridges of sediments that marked the courses of prehistoric Holcom canal systems along Queen Creek and in a portion of the lower Salt River Valley that had been independently mapped by the Soil Conservation Service as discrete soil phases. Survey and geophysical prospecting. Uh, potential irrigation should be inspected through ground pedestrian survey when feasible. This helps to ground truth and refine the interpretation of possible features identified in remote sensing images. Archaeologists need to be familiar with the surface expression of irrigation features and features in their study area as this can be highly variable. Relict irrigation features can be visible on the ground as linear mounds or depressions, linear artifact scatters, areas of different soil color and texture or areas of different vegetation color or type among other manifestations. Surface or low elevation digital photography, now including the use of drones, can also further refine images. And so uh, what you're looking at in this slide here, and I will give uh, full credit here to your host, Andy Christensen, who uh, uh, contacted me during a survey he was conducting outside of Coolidge where a uh, preserved segment of the prehistoric canal Casa Grande uh, was still uh, preserved on the surface in this particular survey area that he was working in. And so we joined him to take a look at it. And uh, uh, this is us standing on the embankments of the uh, relic segment of Canal Casa Grande. And this is a few miles to the east of Casa Grande Ruins National Monument. And uh, this would have been the canal that would have supplied fields that were farmed by the folks living at Casa Grande Ruins. Uh, there are other geophysical prospecting methods that can be used to investigate subsurface irrigation features like ground penetrating radar and magnetometry. Their utility is dependent on the local soil and landscape conditions, for instance, soil salinity and metallic inclusions in soil can inhibit their effectiveness. As shown here, a magnetometer can provide clear documentation of subsurface irrigation features in a highly eroded landscape at La Playa in Sonora. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but the, the two maps on either side are kind of like two versions of the same area uh, that this uh, uh, student, Rachel uh, Kajikas from University of Arizona worked on. 
Uh, and with this magnetometer, you can kind of see in the upper image there, you've got some kind of linear segments of kind of uh, features that kind of show up in that black and white area. And then the lower uh, section down there, the, the image has kind of got the identifications for what they determined those were. So you can see there are canals, uh, agricultural field grids, some water retention features, and other small features that they found during that magnetometer survey. <laughs> The identification of subsurface irrigation features is, a, is accomplished best by controlled archaeological excavation. Backhoe trenching has proven to be the most effective excavation technique in this task in Arizona. In some cases, irrigation features are encountered in the normal course of excavation projects. However, strategies may be developed to target specific areas with a higher probability of containing canals. Mechanical scraping of horizontal exposures of irrigation features with a backhoe also can be informative, particularly in complex areas such as sections with multiple canals and fields. Excavations should be designed to document the canal alignment, stratigraphic relationships between canals and other features, as well as longitudinal variation in the canal channel geometry. Now, once you find a potential subsurface irrigation feature, how do you tell confidently if it's a canal or some other type of feature? The main characteristics of canals are the presence of a depression with a layer or successive layers of alluvial sediments, including sand, silts, and clays. Canal shape and size can be quite variable. Other irrigation features such as reservoirs and settlement basins also contain alluvial sediments, sed sediments but they differ morphologically from canals. In some cases, distinguishing between a canal and a natural channel can also be problematic and requires additional scrutiny. And finally, it may be difficult to distinguish between prehistoric and historic and modern canals. <clears throat> Documentation and sampling. Canals and irrigation features really should be sufficiently documented and sampled to facilitate interpretation and provide material for analysis. Relic canals are mostly stratigraphic phenomena and require careful excavation, mapping, and description. Canal alignment should be traced as far as possible to document longitudinal changes in the channel. Profiles should be drawn of canal st stratigraphy of the vertical exposures in, uh, that are perpendicular to the axis of the alignment. And uh, at the upper left here, you're seeing uh, an example of just a typical uh, profile of a trench exposure of a canal, prehistoric canal. The deposits inside and outside the channel need to be described using standard soil nomenclature. And you need to note unconformities and deposition of the sediments. And then ideally, samples of canal sediments should be collected for analyses such as particle size data, pollen, and microinvertebrates. And also datable materials should be collected. Canal age can be estimated by collecting diagnostic artifacts through screened excavation of canal fill, such as ceramics and other artifacts. Absolute dating is most successful with radiocarbon dating of carbonized plant remains, which can be recovered by flotation of canal fill sediments and optically stimulated luminescence dating of the actual sediments themselves. And I'll talk about that just a little bit briefly. Now, after you collect the field data and the samples, specialized analyses may be pursued, some of which are listed here on the slide. Hydraulic analysis permits the reconstruction of water velocity and discharge two important parameters for understanding irrigation capacity and channel stability. Irrigation canals are subject to the same physical laws that govern stream flow in a natural water course, and so they can be analyzed using principles of open channel hydraulics. Sedimentological analysis can answer questions about the flow history and the depositional regimes of the canals. This is done through laboratory particle size analysis, which allows the correlation of canal sediment textures with specific flow regimes. For example, stagnant water versus high energy flow conditions, where you'd see uh, really coarse sands and gravels if you have a really high velocity flow that's been going through the canal and depositing those larger grain sediments. Uh, micromorphology is a pedostratigraphic analysis technique 
that can be used to reconstruct paleo environmental conditions in a canal or other settings. Plant remains and microinvertebrates, and by those I mean uh, mollusks, very small mollusks, and ostracods, which are very small crustaceans that were deposited in those sediments of the irrigation features, can provide information on hydrological and environmental conditions. This includes data on episodes of water stagnation or desiccation, seasons of canal operation, the nature of crops grown in nearby fields, and water temperature changes, as well as salinity. And then dating of canals is done most fundamentally through relative dating using stratigraphy with other features and temporally diagnostic artifacts in canals, such as diagnostic uh, pottery, uh, most, most commonly used. Absolute dating is used extensively, and the primary techniques are AMS radiocarbon dating of carbonized plant remains and luminescence dating of canal sediments themselves. There are some other methods that you can use, such as archaeomagnetic, uh, archaeomagnetic dating of fine canal sediments, uh, radiocarbon dating of shells in canals, as well as thermoluminescence dating of sherds. <clears throat> Then you get to canal explanation and interpretation. Implementing these types of data recovery and analyses enables researchers to better interpret canals and canal systems and address higher level questions. An important step is to assess the structure or the layout of the canal system. Here we should strive to understand the environmental and the cultural context of the system, such as what settlements and natural features are located within and adjacent to it, also, it's important to establish the chronology of canal system development because it impacts the diachronic interpretation of the canal system growth, size, and it's also its potential productivity. Uh, and just briefly, these uh, maps and diagrams shown on this slide, uh, at the uh, lower left there is just sort of a uh, diagrammatic representation of different types of canal systems that are very simple uh, to complex from the one level system to the four level system. And then on the right is uh, one of the uh, canal systems on the middle Gila River that we investigated for which we actually did a, uh, a, a reconstruction of how the system developed through time. And you can see from the top to the bottom of those three slides is the early to the later period of phase of use. And so this just gives you an idea about all these different techniques I've been talking about that come to bear on really getting a nice big picture look at how these systems develop through time. <clears throat> a next step in assessing, assessing the size or the command area of the irrigated field areas in a, is in a canal system. To estimate command area requires a solid understanding of the location of the main and the distribution canals, but it also depends on how long the lateral canals were that fed the fields. With an average canal length, you can more accurately apply a buffer area along those main and distribution canals to calculate how much area was being farmed. Using this approach, I estimated that the Hohokam on the middle Gila River could have irrigated between 30,000 and 50,000 acres. The larger canal systems in the lower Salt Valley feasibly could have irrigated almost twice that amount. Other analysis methods can assist in reconstructing agricultural yield or productivity. Using command area as a basis, estimates can then be made for the population size that was supported by produce from the fields. This requires certain assumptions. Along the middle Gila River, Ethnographic data on the indigenous historic Akimal Autumn population indicates that an average family of five farmed five acres per year in the early 1900s, or one acre per person. If we assume that the same held for the prehistoric Kohokam, and given our command area estimate that I just mentioned, we could estimate that actually between 30,000 and 50,000 people might have lived along the Middle Gila. And I can go into that in more detail. There's another lecture behind that, but uh, that's just sort of a snapshot of the potential size of the population that could have been supported, assuming a lot of other factors were going quite well for those irrigation systems. 
Ethnographic and historical research provides the basis for much of what we know about the social organization of irrigation management. Such studies generally address the social, political, and economic aspects of irrigation organization. Often missing from this research are the details of the physical elements of the canal system and how those relate to the irrigation organization. Uh, most recent HOCOM research has begun to change this by defining the kinds of groups of people which are linked to specific physical sections of an irrigation system. Another important element for understanding social organization is the amount of labor that was invested in building canals as well as maintaining the canals. Uh, so for example, the volume of soil excavated during canal construction provides a relative measure of labor input. If you make assumptions regarding the amount of soil that a worker can move in a day and the duration of the construction project, you can estimate the size of the work crews that would have been needed for that project. So those measures provide insight into the number of people needed to build and also to maintain the canals, the number of members that might have been part of the organization responsible for managing the system, as well as the size of the population using the canal system. Uh, and briefly, in this uh, one of my uh, favorite slides of uh, a very old photo uh, from the, one of the pueblos in New Mexico, showing the number of people that came out to help clean out the main canal in the spring before the irrigation season got started. And you can see there are quite a few people. And so managing this, organizing it, uh, there's a lot of logistics behind this and it tells you quite a bit about what these communities were doing, the size of the organization, and gives you an idea about the complexity of the management of these kinds of systems. So in conclusion, my goal here tonight has been to show you and review the techniques that have been fruitfully used to detect, document, analyze, and explain ancient irrigation features. The gains in research and knowledge of prehistoric irrigation in Arizona, which resulted from the National Historic Preservation Act, cannot be understated. Uh, Compliance-driven uh, research on ancient irrigation quickly adopted new technologies and tested and refined them. Our studies of prehistoric irrigation went from only basic information to an explosion of new projects, new methodologies, and new techniques. These, study, these studies provided not only data on the structure and chronology of canal systems, but also answers to higher level questions concerning socio-political organization. The advantages of good fundamental data recovery on ancient canals are many-fold. I suggest these same techniques for the detection, documentation, analysis, and explanation can also be productive for the use of studies of irrigation in early states. The selection of techniques must be tailored to the project scope and the budget. However, I believe that much uh, more such studies will open up new understandings of the function of irrigation in early states. And uh, thank you very much.